Hello everyone, Mrs. Fondre here. Today we're going to be talking and learning all about Vincent Van Gogh. Now maybe you've heard that name before because he's probably one of the most famous artists ever to have lived. So it's about time we talk about him in art class, all right? Um, we're going to learn a little bit about his life. We're going to look at some of his, pro his work and make a project based on some of his art, okay? So let me share my screen so we can get started. It's kind of fun because I have two computers going right now. All right, so um, Vincent Van Gogh, let's click to my first slide. Um, this is a self-portrait, so he painted himself and he's really famous for those swirly-whirly kind of lines. So maybe you recognize some of his stuff when we see it. So a little bit about Vincent Van Gogh. He was born in 1850 and he lived until 1890, so he was only 37 years old when he passed away. He's from the Netherlands, which is an area in Europe across the ocean from us, and in less than 10 years, he painted almost 900 paintings. That's a lot of paintings for a decade, so he went pretty fast while he was working. Um, I think something even more interesting than all those paintings is that he also wrote almost 800 letters. I know nowadays people can just call each other or they could send a text message or an email, but back in the 1800s you had to write letters and he wrote letters all the time to his brother and his best friend, potentially his only friend, Theo, his brother Theo. Um, the sad part about him, his life, is that he only sold one painting in his entire life, and nowadays people love his work. Um, one of the reasons why he only sold one painting is that he didn't really have a good time getting along with other people. Um, he's known for not having many friends, and he usually kind of lived and stayed on his own. And one of the most famous things he's actually well known for is that he cut off part of or his entire ear. Um, we'll talk about that in just a little bit because I know everyone always has questions about that. But um, a lot of his most famous work that he did was while he was in an asylum to help hopefully get him me mentally a little healthier. So he checked himself into an asylum and he did lots of paintings. And some of his most famous paintings in the world were created while he was trying to help himself, all right? And he's known as a post-impressionist artist. So, what's post-impressionism? Great question. Glad you asked. Um, if you remember last year, we talked about an artist named Claude Monet. Um, he was really famous for painting haystacks and lily pads and had really, really fast paintings as well. So you can see I have two images here. I have um, Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise, which we looked at last year. And then I have a painting by Vincent van Gogh of similar things there. Um, they're uh, scenes above water, okay? And you can see that they're similar because they use really kind of brighter colors. You can see that pop of orange in the sun for Claude Monet, and you can see those bright stars in, in uh, Vincent van Gogh's. And they really slapped the paint on. They used really thick paint when they went. They didn't care if it was really delicate or easy. They just put it on the canvas. They were painting like crazy people, which is really cool to see. And they usually painted really realistic things, like they would paint landscapes, like both of these paintings are, or they would paint a vase full of flowers, or they would paint a building, so realistic things. So that's how these two styles are similar. Um, but post-impressionism, which is what Vincent Van Gogh did, post-impressionism, um, they are more about making things look more geometric. So that would be using straighter lines or doing really curvy things, all right, versus more realistic proportions. Like instead of having a head shape, it might be more stretched out head shape or full pulled apart face. Um, and they did this kind of stretching and pulling of um, of these objects to kind of make it look a little bit more expressive. So it looks a little bit more interesting and it's able to show off how it's feeling a little bit more. It's kind of when you're expressing your feelings, the whole post-impressionism was starting to express themselves more. And there's actually a style of art that we're gonna hopefully talk about later in the year called expressionism, which follows this one. So paintings get even more stretched out and emotional after a while, all right? And Another thing that's a little different from post-impressionism is the fact that they used unnatural 
or arbitrary color. So not realistic necessarily, all right? We know that the stars in the sky are little tiny blips of white, but you can even see in uh, Van Gogh's painting right here that they look like they're glowing and they're big and they're yellow. So they made them a little bit more not realistic, all right? Because um, Impressionism was all about getting a natural, um, natural lighting as it was in the day, but then post-impressionism was like, nah, let's not do it as realistic. All right, so it gets a little, little more creative here. All right, so let's get into uh, Van Gogh's little mental health for you today. Okay, so back in December 23rd of 1888, um, that was the day that Van Gogh cut off part of his ear. They can't we don't know for sure if it was his entire ear or part of an ear. The records kind of are conflicting on that. But during that moment, he was having a really heated argument with another artist named Paul Gauguin, which is actually another artist we talked about last year as well. So he was having a really, really rough time, a really big argument. Um, and he was actually having kind of a mental breakdown where he was, he was not healthy in his mind. So... Um, he later, like I said, checked himself into an asylum to help hopefully get him in the right track to feeling a little healthier in the mind, thinking more positively, um, being better to himself, right? Um, and they, he even said on the record that he didn't remember doing it. He like was in such a emotional state, he didn't remember cutting part of his ear or his ear off. So he didn't even remember that. Um, and a reason why they think Van Gogh might have done that is because he actually had a problem with his brain. Um, they kind of did some research on um, all of his symptoms and things he talked about, and the doctors today think he would have been um, would have been diagnosed with a temporal lobe epilepsy, which is essentially meaning in his brain he was born with a clump that was not quite right, and it affected the way he thought and the way he saw and the way he interacted with people. So he was not born with a healthy, normal functioning brain. And that's why he had a hard time making friends. And he didn't really have anyone to emotionally support him in his life. He had his best friend, his brother Theo, that would help him out a lot. But Theo lived far away and he didn't have people close by that could care about him. So um, I just want to take a little quick time out to say if you ever feel like you need a team or a support person to be there for you, always know that Mrs. Fondre is there for you because I care about you and I want you to be the best, healthiest young person you can be. All right. So if you ever need someone, I'm totally there for you. I'm sure a lot of your family is there, your friends, your teachers. You, we, you got a team. You got someone you can count on. Okay. Um, so like I said, Van Gogh didn't really have that. And actually a few years after this ear incident, he, um, he was shot and he died of an infection. And some people think he shot himself and some people thought he was accidentally shot while he was out painting. Um, they never found a weapon, so we really can't confirm or deny how or what happened, but he, he passed away from a gunshot wound, which is kind of sad. So he lived kind of a sad life. He just wanted to paint these beautiful, colorful things in this kind of dark mind that he had. He was really kind of, he was troubled and he wanted to make it better through his paintings, but wasn't really appreciated during his time. And now we look back and think, wow, he made some amazing things. And here are just a few of his beautiful, beautiful paintings that he made. And a lot of these were actually made while he was in his asylum trying to work on his mental health. So you can see all of them have a lot of things in common with the short little brush strokes and the swirls and they just are bright colors. So for someone that was pretty sad and kind of on his own all the time, he tried to capture some joy and some light in his work, which is, I think, probably was good for him to do. All right. So uh, the one painting that I know you probably recognize, one of the world famous paintings from Van Gogh, is this beautiful one. And it's called A Starry Night. All right. Um, it's kind of interesting that this painting is only two by three feet big. So it's maybe about this big, not super ginormous, okay? But um, but it was actually donated to the New York Museum. So you can go see it if you go to New York. And a lot of people think that this is his most expensive painting that ever was created that someone bought later after he passed away. But that is not actually true. I want to show you the painting that was the most expensive that was sold from Vincent van Gogh. 
and it is a portrait of his doctor, portrait of Dr. Gashet from 1890. Um, and it sold in 1990 for $82.5 million. And if you do the math with what, how much the dollar is worth today, that's closer to $161 million and 400,000. I said that in the wrong order, but um, it's worth almost double that amount today, which is pretty crazy. All right. So um, with that being said, um, that's a little bit about Van Gogh and kind of his story. And hopefully we can learn a little bit about it with um, appreciating the things around you and finding those people in your life to be your support team. All right. And maybe the fact that making art is a good way to express yourself and uh, kind of keep yourself healthy mentally too, all right? So um, if you have questions, comments, you want to talk more about Van Gogh, please feel free to comment below or to um, send me an email. I'd love to chat more with you about Van Gogh. But as for now, I'm going to stop the video here and I'm going to actually talk to you about what your project is going to be. Hello, kindergartners. Mrs. Fondre here to continue and finish up our Vincent Van Gogh lesson. Here's the project we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to draw inspiration today from Vincent van Gogh's sunflower painting. Uh, you can't re quite remember what that looks like from our presentation. Let me pull up a tab with an image in here to remind you. All right. So um, Vincent van Gogh had these beautiful, beautiful sunflowers that he created that are so bright and colorful and warm and happy. I just love how much yellow we got going on here. All right. So today we're gonna just focus on doing one big sunflower, okay? Cause there's a lot going on in here. So let's simplify, keep it easy peasy and just do one big, beautiful uh, sunflower for us at home, okay? So um, what you're gonna need, the minimum is gonna be a piece of paper uh, and hopefully a little bit sturdier piece of paper cause ideally we are gonna watercolor with this today. But if you don't have watercolors, you can use markers as well. So you're going to need paper. You are going to need a pencil and watercolor if you have it. I have a couple of cups I'll show you in a minute. And uh, it's actually pretty easy to make watercolor at home. So we'll get in that to a minute too if you want to listen for that. And, and you're going to want some crayons or oil pastels. Um, oil pastels are just a little thicker and they leave a really crisp line. But as long as you press down with hard with a crayon, that would work too. Okay. so. Let's get started. First, with a pencil, all right? So let me just put this down here. All right, so on our paper today, we're gonna start our sunflower by doing a blobby kind of circle in the middle, all right? It should probably be almost as big as your fist. Don't trace your fist, because it's gonna look kind of funky then. But we wanna just do a, a lumpy circle. It's okay if it's not perfect, because sunflowers are not perfect either, all right? From here, we're gonna add some petals. And we're doing this with pencil first so we know where we're gonna draw, all right? So I'm gonna do some petals up and up. It kind of looks like a teardrop that meets at a point. Now, these don't have to be exactly the same size. I can kind of do some curving lines out here. Maybe I do some curves here. I just wanted to kind of end with a point, okay? It's okay to leave spaces in between two. And if some of them are a little curvier, that's all right. We're just gonna do a couple petals all the way around. You see how big I'm making it? I'm going for, for a big flower, okay? We're not doing an itty bitty one. I'm going big today, friends. Big sunflower, right? And if you have some really big spaces in between, you could do the top of a flower to make it look like there's a petal behind the other petals. It's called overlapping, right? You can do some overlapping here. Now, from here, it's going to be important. We're going to add a stem because right now our sunflower is just a floating flower and it connects to a stem where we'd be growing in the ground or coming out of a vase. So I'm going to draw two lines at the bottom that just go straight down and off my paper. And this whole part is going to eventually be green. All right. Now with your crayons, you're going to need four colors. You're going to need a yellow, you're going to need an orange-ish color. I got an orange yellow right here. You're going to want a brown and 
that you're going to want a green. All right, and we're actually going to be outlining, which means we're gonna only stay on top of our pencil line, okay? If you just have crayon at home, you want to push down a little hard because it should be solid, okay? There shouldn't be any little sprickly sparklies of your paper going through. So that's what I'm gonna do for my stem, just a little bit of green there. And then the next one I think would be pretty fun to do is the big brown middle of the sunflower. Big brown one. And sunflowers have all sorts of seeds in the middle of it. So what are we gonna do? I'm gonna draw a bunch of little lines. Now, is Mrs. Fondre scribbling? No. Is she going super, super, super fast? A little bit, I'm going a little fast, but I'm making each one a little tiny dot, okay? I'm not sitting there drawing circles, because that would take a long time. I'm just doing little tiny lines, and then go, painted pretty quickly. So I think this would feel the most like Van Gogh did it himself. All right, something like that. And then our next step, we're actually use two colors to make these, uh, these petals pop some more, all right? So I'm gonna start with an orange. I, want, I found a real orange, I'm gonna use orange. And I'm gonna go over each petal with some orange. It's helpful if I didn't break my little pastel, but here we are. So I'm gonna just gently and quickly go over my pencil lines. And if you don't perfectly stay on your pencil lines, it's okay, no worries. From here, now that I have orange on all of them, because you're like, probably thinking, well, this is Andre, and usually sunflowers are yellow. You're right. Let's put some yellow on top. We just started with orange because orange is a little darker. So when I do yellow over the top, if you have oil pastel, it might mix a little, which is all right. Or if you have crayon, you want to put it right next door. So we get a little bit of everything happen in here. All right. It's kind of okay if your colors don't touch each other and they kind of do. It's okay if they mix together a little bit, right? Now, if you have watercolors, you're going to need the same colors. You're going to need yellow, orange, green, and brown. However, if you do not have watercolors at home, you could make some, all right? All watercolor really is, and how you can do it at home, is getting a cup of water and adding food coloring. Drop, drop, drop. And that's all you need. Um, however, if you don't have food coloring or you don't want to run out and get some, that's fine too. The next step, you could just cover with marker. All right, so marker could be for you for the rest of this. However, for the watercolor folks, let me show you what this looks like, all right? It's gonna be a little more uh, colorful if we do it with watercolor, because we're gonna actually mix some colors. We're gonna start with yellow, because that's one of those colors, if it gets mixed in with other things right away, it gets kind of gooey. So. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna actually go over almost everything with yellow, except for the brown and the green. So that means all of the petals and even the area around my petals, all right? So we're gonna do everything. If you're doing watercolor at home, I would definitely recommend newspaper. I don't leave a huge mess everywhere. Mrs. Andre does not care too much if her dust gets dirty because it's easy to clean. So you can start at the very top of your paper and you can just start doing yellow all over, okay? I have really thin paper so you can see it looks really watery right away, but that's okay, it'll dry. We're gonna go over everything. All right, from here, we're gonna get our orange, all right? Now, do I need to clean my brush in between this? No, we do not need to, because we're eventually gonna get to the color brown anyway, so it's gonna get dirty anyway. So we're gonna move our yellow, and with the orange, we're just gonna put a tiny bit. I'm actually, I wanna pick this up once to 
make sure it doesn't get stuck to my desk because that would be no good. Um, the next thing, you're gonna do a little bit of orange only in the petals, okay? So all you really need to do is a little, okay? That adds a little bit pop of color into those petals besides the yellow because flowers aren't perfectly yellow or perfectly purple. They have a little other colors mixed in too. I'm gonna get a little bit and just do a little brush in each one. It's kind of hard to tell right now, but once it dries, you'll be able to see it. All right, from there, we're gonna move on to our green because it is our next darkest color that we have on our list. And all you gotta do is the stem for that one. Easy peasy. Oop, oop, oop. Okay, and from here, our last step is brown. So I'm gonna grab my brown and I'm gonna do the middle. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, so with that being said, you just made a beautiful sunflower, all right? Um, watercolor takes a decent amount of time to dry if you used a lot of watercolor. Um, if you didn't use too much, then it will dry less. And if you use marker, it will be even drier from there, all right? So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please let me know. You could put this into the Seesaw app so I know you completed it. That would be great. Happy creating.